The majority of those who died today were children. Investigators today released a report into the incident, and as Robin Stickley reports, they have no solid idea on why he did it. I, I hate to bring this up, but it gives me the sense of Columbine. He recently started wishing that his son had never been born. When Adam Lanza, hey, Adam Lanza, for Adam Lanza, for Adam Lanza, for Adam Lanza, we're piecing together a picture of Adam Lanza. The day was December 14, 2012, and people in Connecticut were steadily preparing for the holiday festivities that were already on the horizon. Unbeknownst to anyone, what would occur in the morning of that day would not only shake up the state, but the entire United States of America, as Adam Lanza would not only commit one of the deadliest shootings in modern US history, but also the country's deadliest elementary school shooting. Welcome everybody to the first episode of Deadly Minds, where I will explore and explain as many things as I can about some of the biggest and deadliest atrocities that have ever happened in human history. Today we will be looking at one of the most interesting cases that I have ever investigated. A case that has made me go to extreme depths for information, probably more than what is healthy for a person. Well ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, this is the story behind the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Adam Peter Lanza was born on April 22, 1992 in Exeter, New Hampshire to his father Peter and mother Nancy. At the beginning of his life, he lived on land owned by Nancy's family alongside his older brother Ryan. Nancy wanted a fresh start and also wanted a good home and school system that was more suited to her son's needs, so in the summer of 1998, the Lanzas moved to a small town in Connecticut, 36 Yogananda Street, Sandy Hook. Some years later, Nancy and Peter would separate, but wouldn't officially divorce for some time. At the beginning of the divorce, it was hard on Adam and Ryan, but as time moved on, it became easier, and they would still see their dad on the weekends, which was already the norm, since Peter worked very hard and had little time even before the divorce to spend quality time with his family. As a child, Adam was very quiet and shy and didn't speak much, sometimes he wouldn't speak at all and would babble incoherent sentences that no one could understand. Although his speech would start to develop later on, more and more issues rose to the surface. Throughout his schooling days, Adam experienced various changes. He attended Sandy Hook Elementary School from kindergarten to fourth grade. He then moved on to Newtown Middle School from grade 5 to 7. Around the time he was in seventh grade, Adam moved to St. Mary's Catholic School. The reason he switched schools was due to being diagnosed with Asperger's, which is a developmental disorder that falls under the umbrella of autism. And due to this, he would have difficulty with social communication and also had sensory sensitivities, especially towards sound and texture. He was a vegan who apparently did not like the texture of food. His mental issues, accompanied with school and societal stress, made his mother make a decision to transfer him to St. Mary's Catholic School, which had smaller classes and was also thought to be more in line with Adam and his learning style. Upon completing middle school, Adam enrolled in the ninth grade of Newtown High School, where he would only last about a year before his mental issues became just too much for him to bear. He was then homeschooled up until graduation. Adam very rarely showed emotion, as a kid and as an adult. During his school years, he was very quiet and didn't really socialize much with his peers. After the shooting, a former classmate of his said this, if you looked at him, you couldn't see any emotions going through his head. When Adam was in 5th grade, he was already very quiet and reserved, but was also very bright and had good ideas especially when it came to creative writing, but one piece of his creativeness was quite shocking. He and his classmate wrote a book as part of a project in school. The book was called Big Book of Granny. 
The book served as an interesting and also significant part of constructing a psychological profile of Adam, especially during his elementary school years. Not long before he wrote this book, his parents separated, and his dad moved out of the house in early 2002. The book offers just a glimpse into Adam's way of thinking and his family life during their hard times. The book contained a dramatic text filled with images of child murder, cannibalism, and human taxidermy. The book's contents were so alarming that if more carefully reviewed by school staff, Adam would most likely be referred to a child psychiatrist or another mental health professional, since children of his age should not be thinking about these kinds of topics. There were even some unconfirmed reports that stated that Adam tried to sell the book to his peers for 25 cents, although this detail does not appear anywhere in the official investigative records. An unknown child advocate said, while many children, and especially boys of his age, contend with anger and violent impulses in their play and creative productions, the Big Book of Granny stands out to mental health professionals as a text marked by extreme thoughts of violence that should have signified a need for intervention and evaluation. Due to the severity of his issues and the fact that he was homeschooled, Adam didn't participate in his middle school dance, nor the prom. His family, not wanting to make him feel even more ostracized from society and normality of life, bought him a game similar to Dance Dance Revolution, where he could dance whenever he wanted and how long he wanted. This developed into an obsession, and Adam would go to the AMC theaters in Danbury, Connecticut, and would oftentimes play for hours on end. Sometimes, he would be there for as long as 10 hours, and would come out of the building drenched in sweat. There are even some clips of him dancing available online, some filmed by strangers filming him and laughing, and some filmed on a phone, most likely by an acquaintance of Adam. At the beginning of this clip, it sounds like someone recognized him, as they say, Adam fucking Lanza. <laughs> he was evidently very good at the game, some attributing this to him having Asperger's, and hyperfixating on DDR, causing him to become very good. Since Adam was naturally very skinny, and him being a vegan and not liking many foods, playing DDR for hours on end probably made him lose a lot of calories, contributing to his already very anorexic body state. Reports say that during the time of the shooting, he weighed only around 111 pounds or 50 kilograms. And since he was around 6 feet tall, that would make him severely underweight. Some people even believe that Adam suffered from anorexia-induced brain damage, since anorexia can lead to malnutrition which causes brain damage. Another interesting thing I want to point out is the fact that even though some of these clips are months apart from one another, he seems to wear the exact same clothing every time. Dark grey sweater, beige cargo pants, white socks and black shoes. As a matter of fact, his cabinet was filled with only white socks of the same type, and even when he was in high school, his classmates said he would wear the exact same clothing every single day. The most eerie thing about this clip is that it was filmed only around 9 months before the actual shooting, and he was already most likely planning or at least thinking about the shooting by this point. Adam attended two colleges, both for a relatively short time, the Western Connecticut State University and the Norwalk Community College. He took this eerie picture as his photo ID. He excelled in math and computing courses, which is no surprise since he was already interested in technology in high school and was by all accounts computer savvy. He was also interested in language and participated in a language course as well. His dad Peter believed that Adam was taking too many courses and that his anxiety and mental health issues would only get worse because of that. This was true since when he was taking college courses he would often cry in frustration and refer to himself as a loser. He referred to himself as a loser as early as elementary school. Due to his father saying that, he cut all ties with him and didn't speak to his dad for the rest of the time he was alive, not responding when being called or texted. It was reported after the shooting that Adam had no contact with his father and brother for almost two years. In the enigma of Adam Lanza's mind and motivations for murder, 
Peter Langman of the Langman Psychological Associates believed that Lanza was suffering from schizophrenia since he was expressing several behaviors and traits that are associated with being schizophrenic. One of them is lacking expressed emotion or the so-called flat effect. Pictures of Adam when he was a teenager and a young man shows him always having a blank stare, that's sort of a deer in the headlights look, with his eyes wide open and his face expressionless, as if he was a mannequin. Another trait that Adam possessed was his failure or inability to speak, even when him speaking was to be accepted or even helpful. An example of this is Adam's hairdresser, with whom he never talked to and was always accompanied by his mother, who answered for him. I know the mother and the son. How, well, how do you know them? They used to come here for haircuts. So I know the mother used to bring them in. So that's, that's the only way I know them. They used to come here for years. And uh, we would come here and get a haircut. Wouldn't talk to anybody. Uh, look down at the ground, make no eye contact. Matter of fact, when I was done, when I was up front, I would go up front get him to cut his hair, and I'd say, Adam, come on. He wouldn't move. The mother would have to say, Adam, come on, he's ready. So I was like, I was invisible. Same thing at the end of the haircut. I'd say, Adam, okay, you're all set, Adam. You're all set. He wouldn't get out of my chair until the mother actually came over. All right, come on, Adam, let's go. And grab by the arm, and then say, all right, you're ready to go. He's done. We can go now. And that was it. So. When you were attempting to try to talk to him, did you <clears> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would always make jokes with him, trying to talk to him, and just make conversations with him, but he was here. He wouldn't say a word. He, he wouldn't look down for the tile. He wouldn't look up. He looked down the whole time. So he wouldn't even make eye contact. He wouldn't talk to me. And I'm a talker. I try to talk to everybody. And he just wouldn't even respond to me. He wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't say anything. He would look down at the tile. He wouldn't bring his eyes up. His eyes wouldn't raise down up from the tile. The only time that he would move or make any type of movement is when his mother told him to. That was it. And those were the only times. Those were the only times he moved or he made any type of response from everything, anything. He would walk out ahead of his mother and that's it. I want to quickly talk about something that he said. Adam Lanza's mother, Nancy Lanza. Nancy was pretty much the only woman in Adam's life. Hell, she was pretty much the only person in his life. After she and Peter divorced and Ryan moved away due to work-related reasons, the only person Adam had actual contact with was his mom and that one DDR friend, which I will mention later on, with whom he would sometimes not even talk to in their own house, but would rather email her and they would communicate through text, whilst being meters away from each other. A little before the shooting, Adam made a document titled Selfish in which he focused on explaining why females are selfish, in his opinion. The document expresses extremely hostile opinions on women and their sexuality. To be honest, I don't know why, but it's kind of interesting to me that he uses the word female instead of woman or girl when describing them, since that is the buzzword, or whatever you want to call it, of this modern time, especially on Twitter, man. You call some chick a female, ooh, your ass is gonna get cancelled, bro. Dead ass. The other interesting thing about this document is that since Nancy was the only woman in his life, this may as well be referring to her and even adding to the theory that their relationship was virtually non-existent. In 2011, so about a year before the shooting, he would post this message online, responding to someone else sarcastically saying that he would bang his mom. We will fuck her together, then kill her and dispose of the corpse. Adam did also not use his cell phone. Whenever someone would call him, he would just let it go to voicemail. And this is what he did to his dad after their relationship crumbled in 2010. And before he went to Sandy Hook, Adam would smash his computers and destroy the hard drives so that any possible evidence or a digital footprint of him would be harder to find. Okay, now we have pretty much gone over Adam's life, and it's now the time to talk about December 14th, 2012 were also known as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Before I discuss the actual day of the shooting, I want to quickly go over some time periods before that, since I believe it's necessary to look at the bigger picture instead of just the day of the massacre. On January 5th, 2012, Nancy would purchase a Glock 20 SF pistol, which is the same weapon Adam would bring to Sandy Hook and also commit suicide with. 
On April 22nd of 2012, Adam had his 20th birthday. 20 is also the same age he previously compared Travis the Chimp to in terms of mental and emotional development at the time of Travis's attack and death. To those of you who don't know, Travis was a chimp who on February 16th, 2009, attacked and brutally mauled his owner's friend Charlotte Nash to the point of just severe disfigurement. He was also later shot to death by responding officers. Here is a quick snippet of the 911 call made, which is extremely disturbing, so just be aware. Stand for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is here. 231 Rock, Rock Crimmon Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. What's the problem there? The, the, the chip killed my, my friend. What's the problem with your friend? Oh. Please. What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Send the police up with a gun. With a gun. Hurry You're up. Off a gun. Please hurry up. He's killing my girlfriend. You can literally hear Travis in the background making noises as he is attacking Charla. She would actually end up surviving miraculously, but her injuries were very severe, and she is faced with a lifetime of trauma and permanent disfigurement. Now you may ask yourself, why am I even mentioning Travis and what does this have to do with Adam? Well, on the 20th of December of 2011, so a little less than a year before the shooting, Adam would make a call to a radio show called Anarchy Radio, where he would discuss Travis and his opinions on the whole thing. He would use the fake name Greg for this. Here is the call that Adam made. Here we go. Hello. We get the collapsible headphones here, but uh, we're back. Sorry, we got Greg on the phone. Oh, Greg. Okay. How's it going? Oh, hi, good. Um, I'm a fan of your writing. Um, Thank you. I'm Thank sorry you to mess up such an old news story, but I couldn't find anything that you said about the topic, and it seems relevant to your interest, so I thought I'd bring up Travis the Chimp. Do you remember him? I don't. Well... Um, he was a highly domesticated chimpanzee who lived in a suburban home in Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Oh. And he was raised just like a human child starting from the week he was born. By the time that he was 14 years old, which would be somewhere around age 20 in human years. Uh-huh. Um, he slept in a bed. He took his own baths. He dressed himself. He brushed his teeth with an electric toothbrush. <laughs> really? When was this? Um... Well, this happened in early 2009. Oh. Oh. Um, uh huh. He ate his meals at a table and enjoyed human foods like ice cream. And he used a remote control to watch television and liked baseball games. And he even used a computer to look at pictures on the internet. Huh. And it goes without saying that Travis was very overweight. He was 200 pounds when he should have been around the low hundreds. Mm -hmm. And he was actually taking Xanax. <laughs> Amazing. I couldn't find any information about why he was taking it, but it just seems to say a lot that he was giving it at all. And basically, I think Travis wasn't really any different than a mentally handicapped human child. Hmm. But anyway, one day in February 2009, he was acting very agitated, and at some point, grabbed the car his owner's car keys, went outside and started beeping from car to car, apparently wanting to go for a car ride and he was acting very aggressively. So his owner called her friend over to get her to help him to calm down and go back inside. And once she arrived, he immediately attacked her and his owner tried to stop him, but couldn't. And she even resorted to stabbing him with a knife, but nothing worked. And she said that after she stabbed him, he looked at her as if to say, why do you do that to me, mom? Because apparently that was what their relationship was like, no different than between a human mother and a human child. So after the stabbing, she called the police, who arrived 12 minutes after the attack, at which point her friend was pretty close to dead. And once the cruiser came up, Travis went over to it, tried to open the locked passenger door. He smashed off the side view mirror, went over to the driver's door, opened it, and the cop shot him. He fled back into the house, where he went to his playroom and bled to death. Hmm. And, um... This might not seem very relevant, but I'm bringing it up because afterward, everyone was condemning his owner for saying how irresponsible she was for raising a chimp like it was a child, and that she
you should have known something like this would happen because chimps aren't supposed to be living in civilization. They're supposed to be living in the wild among each other. Mm -hmm. But their criticism stops there, and the implication is that there's no way anything could have gone wrong in his life if he had been living in civilization as a human rather than a chimp. Ah, indeed. Is in Chavez um, because he brings up questions about this whole process of child raising. Um, yeah. Civilization isn't something which just happens to gently exist without us having to do anything because every newborn child, human child, is born in a chimp like state and civilization is only sustained by conditioning them for years on end so that they'll accept it for what it is. And since we've gone through this conditioning, we can observe a human family raising a human child and I'm sure that even you have trouble intuitively seeing it as something unnatural but when we see a chimp in that position we visually know that there's something profoundly wrong with the situation and it's easy to say there's something wrong with it simply because it's a chimp but what's the real difference between us and our closest relatives and Travis wasn't an untamed monster at all um, he wasn't just feigning domestication he was civilized um, he was able to integrate into society. He was a chimp actor when he was younger, and his owner drove him around the city frequently in association with her towing business where he met many different people and got along with everyone. If Travis had been some nasty monster all his life, it would have been widely reported, but to the contrary, it seems like everyone who knew him said how shocked they were that Travis had been so savage because they knew him as a sweet child. And there were two isolated incidents early in his life when he acted aggressively, but summarizing them would take too long, so basically I'll just say that he didn't act really any differently than a human child would, and the people who would use that as an indictment against having chimps live as humans do wouldn't apply the same thing to humans, so it's just kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But anyway, look what civilization did to him. It had the same exact effect on him as it has on humans. He was profoundly sick in every sense of the term, and he had to resort to these surrogate activities like watching baseball and looking at pictures on a computer screen and taking Xanax. He was a complete mess. Mm -hmm. And his attack wasn't simply because he was a senselessly violent, impulsive chimp, um, which was how his behavior was universally portrayed. Um, immediately before his attack, he had desperately been wanting his owner to drive him somewhere. And the best reason I can think of for why he would want that looking at his entire life would be that some little thing he experienced was the last straw and he was overwhelmed by the life that he had and he wanted to get out of it by changing his environment and the best way that he knew how to deal with that was by getting his owner to drive him somewhere else yeah and when his owner's, owner's friend arrived he knew that she was trying to coax him back into his life of domestication and he couldn't handle that so he attacked her and anyone else who approached him and dismissing his attack as simply being the senseless, violent impulsiveness of a chimp instead of a human is wishful thinking at best. Mm -hmm. His attack can be seen entirely parallel to the attacks and random acts of violence that you bring up on your show every week. Mm. Committed by humans, which the mainstream also has no explanation for. And no. An actual human, I just, just don't think it would be such a stretch to say that he very well could have been a teenage mall shooter or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And Wow. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. That's quite a story. Yeah, that's uh, really apropos, isn't it? Travis yeah. the Chimp. It's just that I'm a little surprised that I never heard you bring it up at all because maybe I'm just seeing connections where there aren't any, but... No, not, I think not. No, I just... I didn't catch that one. I didn't... Uh, maybe I was out of the country or something. I don't know, but I missed it. Thanks very much, man. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Wow. Very well articulated, I think. If any of you have any doubt, this was actually confirmed to be Adam by Adam himself, since he created a thread called Rest in Peace Travis the Chimp, on which he also posted his call to the radio show. His online moniker for this website was Smiggles, which was also confirmed to be Adam. The thing I noticed about this call was that he sort of eerily uses Travis as a metaphor for himself and his beliefs. On the 23rd of July 2012, Adam would write this email to an unnamed cyber acquaintance. My interest in mass murder has been perfunctory for such a long time. The enthusiasm I had back when Virginia Tech happened 
feels like it's been gone for a hundred billion years. I don't care about anything, I'm just done with it all. On the 15th of November 2012, Nancy would write an email to Peter in response to him being frustrated that Adam hasn't responded to his emails for over a year. I will talk to him about that, but I don't want to harass him. He has had a bad summer and actually stopped going out. He wouldn't even go to the grocery store, so it's been pretty stressful. Yesterday was the first time in months I've been able to talk him into going to do his own shopping and his car battery was actually dead because it's sad so I ended up spending most of the day getting it fixed and now I'm going to have to start pressuring him to go out all over again. Now by this point Adam has essentially not left his room for months ever since June of 2012 and why is that? Well that is where that DDR friend of his that I mentioned earlier comes into play. Him and Adam got into a serious fight and Adam would cut all contact with said friend and since that was pretty much his one and only friend, Adam now had no one. When Nancy said he has had a bad summer, this is what she meant. The fight caused Adam extreme stress, anxiety and depression and he would isolate himself even further. His room and computer basically became his whole world. Even in late October when Hurricane Sandy hit, and the Lanza household would lose electricity for several days, Adam still refused to go anywhere and Nancy had told her friends that he had basically shut down. Oh, uh, a little side note, have any of you ever tried to make Adam's cookie recipe? If so, just let me know down below cause hell, I might try to do it. On November 22nd, Nancy traveled to New England to visit family for Thanksgiving. Adam did not want to go, so he stayed home by himself, and at this point he was almost 100% already planning his shooting rampage. On December 1st, Nancy emailed her friend about violent drawings she found that were made by Adam, although she did not confront him about it. On the 10th of December, Nancy texted a friend about Adam bumping his head really hard to the point of blood being drawn, but she also said that it looks worse than it actually is. On the 11th of December, so only 3 days before the shooting, Nancy again left Adam home alone since she went on a two night stay to a wellness center in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. There have been reports that Nancy's health was declining and she herself had anxieties about her health issues and also her family's genetic predisposition for early death which she called a time bomb. She learned that she had lesions on her brain similar to her grandfather who died because of it. She arrived home in the early evening hours of December 13th. That night she would go to bed not knowing she would never wake up and that her son was about to commit one of the worst school shootings in American history. On the same day, the GPS unit in Adam's car showed that he drove past the Sandy Hook school presumably to scope it out the day before the attack, although there was no indication that he actually drove onto the school property. The time was from 9.09 am to 9.32 am, so almost exactly a day before the shooting meaning that Adam knew he would attack the school somewhere during this time tomorrow. Okay, now that we got all of that out of the way, it is finally time to discuss the Sandy Hook shooting. Now, since I am going to be discussing the deaths of people, including children, viewer discretion is strongly advised, so if you don't want to hear about that stuff, just skip ahead. Adam would wake up in the early hours of December 14th, 2012, knowing this will be his last day on earth and knowing he is about to commit an unspeakable atrocity. He most likely filled all of his magazines during the time Nancy was gone on her two day vacation. His arsenal of weapons was the following. A Bushmaster XM15 E2S with multiple 30 round magazines, some of which were made into mag couplers a Glock 20 SF handgun with multiple magazines and a Zig Zauer 9mm pistol with multiple magazines. He would also bring with him a Zyga 12 shotgun with two full magazines although the gun remained in his trunk and was not used during the shooting. Adam would then get dressed in all black, black polo shirt, black t-shirt, black boxers, black socks, black shoes, black fingerless gloves and a black fishing hat. He would also wear black sunglasses during the shooting. At the end, he would put on an olive colored fishing vest where all of his magazines were stored. As I said before, Adam would also destroy his computer's hard drive, the possible motivations for which I will discuss later on. 
Adam was now fully prepared to carry out his attack. But before driving to Sandy Hook, Adam had one more thing he needed to do. He would slowly and carefully walk to his mother, who was sleeping in her room, and a little before 9.30 a.m., Adam would shoot her four times in the head from a very close distance with a 22 caliber rifle. Why four times? Well, Adam's father Peter believed he pulled the trigger once for each of the family members. One for Nancy, one for Peter, one for Ryan, and one for Adam himself. Honestly, I don't know why, but the title of the book that Nancy was reading is super eerie to me. Train your brain to get happy. Jesus Christ, man. Adam now knew that there was no going back. Once he pulled that trigger on his mom, his life was essentially over. Maybe killing his mom was a mercy kill for Adam, not wanting her to experience all of the hate she inevitably would. Maybe it was revenge for Adam. Maybe it was the last straw to make him get into a mind state of no return, something we will never know the full answer to. After killing his mom, Adam would get into her car and make a few minute drive towards Sandy Hook. I always think this, what was going through his mind during this small drive? He had just killed his mom in an absolutely brutal way, and he was about to shoot up an elementary school. I honestly can't even begin to fathom what must have been going through his mind during this time. Maybe nothing at all. Maybe he was just so detached from reality that he felt like a passenger in his own body and just wanted his life to end as quickly as possible. But before he did, he had in his mind that he wanted to inflict pain and suffering to as many people as he humanly could. He arrived to Sandy Hook around 9.35 a.m. He got out of his car, grabbed his weapons, except for the shotgun, ditched his two sweaters, and made his way to the front entrance. Since the school system had a safety feature, the doors were locked and the only way to open them was from the inside of the school office. But Adam had a powerful rifle and he shot at the glass next to the main door a few times, shattering it, which allowed him to enter the school. Now there is sort of a Mandela effect here, since some people swear that they saw the footage of Adam entering the school, whilst others say that there is no footage, since the camera in the office did not store recorded footage. I guess you could say it's some sort of lost media. After firing his first 8 shots, shattering the glass, Don Hoshprung, Mary Sherlock, and Natalie Hammond, who were having a meeting with the other school employees further down the hall, noticed the commotion and exited the conference room to see what was going on. The women shouted, Shooter! Stay put! And immediately after, Adam would begin his massacre. He would pull the trigger on his rifle multiple times, killing Hoshprung and Sherlock whilst shooting Hammond in the foot. Hammond would end up surviving by first pretending to be dead and then hiding in a conference room. Adam would make his way to the room on his right, going to the nurse's office, where he fortunately didn't see anyone, so he left shortly after. After making his way down the hall, he would fire multiple shots at the already dead Hoshprung and Sherlock. It is also worth noting that the school intercom had been accidentally switched on, meaning everyone at the school just heard their beloved faculty members getting murdered. Adam would also go to the same conference room where the previous meeting was held, but the other faculty members managed to hide, and although Adam walked in and scoped the place out, he did not notice anyone, so he left. He would then continue walking down the hallway towards the classrooms. He would first bypass classroom number 12, but since there was a dark paper covering the window, this was still left up from a lockdown drill the school did a bit earlier. He assumed nobody was in, so he walked further down to the classroom number 10. Since his jungle mag, which was firstly inserted into his gun for easier and faster reloading, was found in classroom number 10, it is widely considered he entered that classroom first. After he made entrance, Adam moved towards the windows where he had a better scope of the entire classroom and fired four shots into the teacher, 27-year-old Victoria Soto, killing her immediately. After killing the teacher, Adam would need to reload because he ran out of ammo. As soon as he started fiddling with his gun, six-year-old Jesse Lewis would shout to his classmates to run out of the room. Nine did and were spared. Jesse is widely regarded as a hero of the shooting, saving multiple of his friends, whilst bravely staring pure evil in its eyes. 
After successfully reloading his gun and chambering around, Adam would kill everyone else in that classroom. His second victim was Jesse Lewis himself. The rest were another teacher, 52-year-old Anne-Marie Murphy, whilst the rest of his victims were all 6-7-year-old to seven year old first graders. Their names were Allison Wyatt, Aviel Richman, Dylan Hockley, and Olivia Engel. Adam emptied out his magazine, dropping it on the floor, and shortly after, leaving the classroom. Adam would then move on to classroom number 8, where two teachers, 30-year-old Lauren Rousseau and 29-year-old Rachel Devino, were desperately trying to fit all 16 students into a small bathroom at the back corner of the classroom, whilst also trying to barricade the door so Adam couldn't enter. To give you a perspective of just how small this bathroom was, here are some pictures. They would eventually manage to fit all of the 16 students into the small bathroom, but soon after, Adam would enter the class, first killing the two teachers and then walking to the back of the classroom, firing almost 80 shots at a very close distance into the small bathroom full of children. His gun would jam two times during the shooting, so he ejected both magazines, one with 10 rounds left in it and the other with 13. The cause of these malfunctions was most likely due to the gun not being maintained slash cleaned properly. All but one of the students would end up being fatally shot. The cause of death for most of them was multiple gunshot wounds to the body. The victims of this horrific massacre were Charlotte Bacon, Daniel Barden, Josephine Gay, Anna Marcus Green, Madeline Sue, Catherine Hubbard, Chase Kowalski, James Mattioli, Grace Audrey McDonnell, Emily Parker, Noah Posner, Jake Pinto, Jessica Rakos, Benjamin Wheeler, and Carolyn Praviti. They were all, yet again, first graders between the ages of 6 and 7 years old. In the midst of the shooting, one student shouted, Help! I don't want to be here! Adam responded to him, Well, you're here, before shooting the student multiple times. I mean, this is just absolute pure evil. Although what Adam said during the shooting has never been 100% confirmed, some reports stated that Adam said things like, look at me, and hands up during the shooting. I honestly can't even imagine the level of trauma that one girl who survived the bathroom massacre must have experienced. I just hope she has a good support system and has received immense therapy and help because seeing 15 of your friends and two of your beloved teachers being killed in such a brutal way in front of you has to be just a unfathomably bad experience on a supposedly happy day at school. I can't even begin to imagine. After leaving classroom 10, Adam noticed that his gun is overheating and isn't working properly. He ejects a few live rounds and drops the magazine with several rounds still in it and inserts a new one in order to fix it. He made his way back to classroom number 8 and fired 15 rounds out of the window, hitting cars that were parked outside but no people. His bushmaster would once again jam and frustrated, Adam would drop the gun on the ground. Adam would exit the classroom and he would notice responding officers already entering the school. He would fiddle with his Glock 20 SF, ejecting multiple live rounds. He actually fired one round from this gun before, most likely in order to test it before the actual suicide later, but the gun jammed. After fixing the jam, Adam would kneel down in the pose that was the same as his picture he took a few years back, which I actually showed earlier. He would chamber around, and at around 9.40am would pull the trigger. Here is his suicide shot, which can be heard from a 911 call made by a teacher. Pick up right away, okay? I'm going to stay on the line with you. Do you understand? Can you can you put pressure on, ma'am? 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 I'm here. He's outside the door. Ma'am? Ma'am, do you have a description of the shooter? No, I do not. You don't? You didn't see the shooter? No. You just have a woman that was shot. Can you, can, can you, um, do you know how to administer, um, first aid? No. 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 Can you put pressure on her wounds? No. To stop, you can't? What's, what's going on? Talk to me. He's, he's fucking right outside the door. I don't want to move. He's outside the door. What building are you in and what, what's the room number? <coughs> room 9. Room 9, he's outside her door right now. They have a person that was shot. After committing suicide, the gun would jam yet again. 
the Sandy Hook shooting was finally over. In a little under 5 minutes, Adam would kill 26 innocent people, 20 of them being first grade children. He would also injure an additional 2 others. The police response was actually pretty quick and it most likely prevented Adam from continuing his massacre and killing even more people. Here is a video of a police officer being notified of the shooting whilst conducting an ordinary traffic stop. After the school shooting, Adam's brother Ryan was actually accused of committing the shooting first and that was because Adam brought Ryan's ID with him to the school. He made these posts on Facebook slamming CNN who falsely reported it and stating that he was miles away and was returning home. He would actually get taken in by police for questioning but he was released afterwards. Ryan has never actually given a public statement or an interview and has always stayed out of the limelight. Adam's father Peter has also not given many interviews but he has said in one that he wishes that his son Adam had never been born. As you could expect, the entire community, state and country was in absolute shock by what happened in Sandy Hook and although huge promises were made, we know now that almost nothing has changed and school shootings still occur all too frequently in the United States. The Sandy Hook Elementary School was also demolished and a brand new school with more security features and a brighter appearance was built in its place. The home of Adam Lanza was also demolished back in 2015 since even just the sight of that house brought up a lot of bad memories for people living nearby and it also attracted unwanted tourism. People also just didn't want to be constantly reminded of where Adam's rampage would begin. In November of 2022, a memorial dedicated to the 26 victims of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was opened to the public. Nancy was left out, most likely because her death didn't occur in the school itself. But honestly, no matter how much time passes and how many things are done, the families of the victims will never truly recover. And December 14th, 2012 will always mark the day that their lives were changed forever. So Adam's mother Nancy was initially, and to be honest still is to a certain degree, extremely hated by people all around the country for obviously not seeking more help and not recognizing that her son was in clear mental and physical deterioration and most damning of all, introducing him to guns and shooting. Now I am not going to say that this is on her since the woman is dead and at the end she should not be solely held responsible for what her son did. I mean he was 20 years old at the time, it's not like it's the Ethan Crumbly case when the kid was 15 and the parents were jackass idiots. She is not here to defend herself and she is honestly so so frequently left out as a victim of this incident, which she clearly was. So just let her and the other victims rest in peace man. After the shooting, investigators wanted to find a motive, obviously. But since Adam was an extremely isolated individual who killed essentially the only person he had at least a smidge of contact with and also destroying his main hard drive, it was difficult for investigators to come to an objective motive. Now he most likely destroyed his hard drive because, to be honest, there would be some pretty messed up shit on there, even something like cheese pizza probably. So throughout the investigation, they discovered that Adam had a vast interest in mass shootings and mass killers. He edited multiple Wikipedia entries about certain shootings down to the smallest minute details. He also created a spreadsheet of mass killers where he ranks the individuals based on the amount of people they killed and injured. He also included the weapons they used, how the shooting ended, the time and place of the shooting and so on and so forth. He would also discuss mass killers frequently online 
once even stating that serial killers are lame and that mass murderers are the cool kids. I guess one could say that he was obsessed with mass killings down to the smallest details. Adam also hated culture to an extreme extent and he did not want to defy himself by its standards. Here is him talking about culture and criticizing it. I didn't understand this when I was younger, but I've always had an immense hatred for culture. I considered culture to be delusional values which humans mindlessly coerce onto each other, spreading it no differently than any other disease. I previously sought to eliminate my cultural values to the greatest extent that I could. Through this I expected to gradually discover values of an inner self which could be reconciled with this society, so that I could engage in activities and pursue goals which would lead to happiness. Eventually I got to a point where I had sufficiently freed myself from what I called cultural values. When I analyzed all of the things which brought me happiness and all of the goals which I wanted to pursue, I realized that absolutely everything about those things that appealed to me was entirely a consequence of my cultural infection. Formerly, I had rejected some aspects of culture while accepting other ones and merely not calling them cultural, as if those values were somehow transcendent and mine. It was at that point that I realized that there is no such thing as an inner self. Any sense of self is a delusional cultural construct. I realized that cultural infections were the sole source of any possible value beyond base values. For a while, I believed that happiness could be attained if culture could theoretically be eradicated in anarcho-primitivism or to take hold. Replace all instances of technology with culture in the analytic sections of industrial society in its future, and you basically have a mentality at the time regarding the pernicious effects of culture. Investigators also found out that Adam had an interest in children. He was an anti-natalist, meaning he believed that humans should not procreate and have children. He would also discuss subjects like pedophilia and societal rape with other users online. But the most interesting part of this to me is that he wrote a 35 page essay on pedophilia where he defends it and even offers arguments why it is beneficial for both the child and the adult in the pedophilic relationship. There was also a tip given to the FBI by an online acquaintance of Adam where he stated that Adam had an unhealthy obsession with children and that he wanted to save them from a corrupt society and that the only way they would be saved is to not experience living in it anymore. I mean, this is just even further proving that his motivations for killing was most likely to save the kids from experiencing a corrupt and unjust society. In 2021, Adam's YouTube channel Cultural Philistine was discovered, a whole 9 year after the shooting. The account was since deleted, actually quite shortly after it was found, but I managed to find an archive of all of his videos and there was one in particular that I think solidifies what his motive was. You don't care about children, I do care about children. You're the one who wants to rape children, I'm the one who wants to save them from a life of suffering that you want to impose onto them. You're the one who sees them as your property, I'm the one who wants to free them. So, in my opinion, with all that being said, this was Adam's motivation for the Sandy Hook shooting. Since his own life was just so miserable and pathetic, he wanted to save and free the children from the same misery he was experiencing and he did not want culture to essentially rape them and indoctrinate them to a life of pain and suffering. Adam never left a suicide note, a final message or anything to that regard. But I think that this video represents the closest thing we will ever get to a suicide note. Relatively speaking, and within the context of being alive, I have always been in a very privileged position. At this point in my life, I can pursue and achieve practically anything I would desire. If I were to commit suicide, I'm certain that, certain that many people would say, I can't believe that lazy, spoiled loser killed himself. I've always been poor, my parents beat me, I was bullied every day as a child, and I got raped. But despite all of that, I still choose to live. This may seem counterintuitive at first glance, but my position is that someone does not choose to live despite suffering. They choose to live because suffering is life affirming. The way that culture operates might help to demonstrate this. The first thing that anyone says when someone is suicidal, other than possibly saying you need medication to change your mentally ill thoughts, is you need to have goals in your life. But what are goals? A feral child does not have any goals. A feral child would not have any desire to become a renowned writer or an eminent scientist or have interesting hobbies, or become an interesting person, or develop any, any of those character building traits. However, if that child were uncultured, he would develop innumerable goals to achieve various things. Culture did not allow the feral child to discover the pleasure which he can achieve from experiencing any of those things. Culture imposed the deprivation of not achieving those things, and thus created out of nothing the pleasure which results from fulfilling that deprivation. 
culture is masochism. Since life seeks to propagate itself, I suspect that culture emerged to prevent human intellect from enabling feral people to lose their aversion to death. Ted Kuczynski's experience is an example of this happening. When he had spent enough time alone in his cabin, he said that he became okay with dying at any moment because he was happy with his life. My interpretation of this is that he had sufficiently overcome his enculturation to the point where he was no longer being hurt by it. Since he wasn't to be hampered with the deprivation which culture imposes, he was not afraid of dying. In the past, the cultural reason why you couldn't kill yourself was because God said so, or because he'll continue some metaphysical cycle of suffering, or because your parents own your body and suicide is dishonorable. These days, the dominant cultural justification for life is this belief that you can't kill yourself because there are things that need to be accomplished in life. But you do not live for the achievement of your goals. You have goals so that you will continue to live and thus will continue to propagate life. I used to distinguish between the fulfillment of cultural and feral values, but then I realized that feral values are just as coercive as the delusion as cultural values are. I still emphasize cultural so much because of how prominent it is. And once you understand that culture is the disease, you can recognize that life itself is a disease. The deprivation which results from the existence of both cultural and feral values are the only reason why anyone wants to live. Life is suffering. Everyone has heard that statement, but they don't accept it at face value. They interpret it to mean that life has suffering, but life is suffering, and suicide is the solution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the video. This actually took quite some time to make, but learning all the nuances and small details about this case was actually very interesting. So if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to my channel for future similar in-depth videos about these tragic events. Anyways, peace out.